thank you for coming tonight. Um, it's great to be here. I've been looking forward to this event for a while now, and it's really cool to be here with you. Thank you for um, skipping not only the Mueller report, but you know the NCAA basketball tournament and whatever else is going on in this amazing city this evening to, to be um, here at University Bookstore and to hear some from me about uh, Project Censored. Um, I wanted to begin by asking some really big questions that I hope you'll let rumble around in your mind as I uh, uh, say a few things about the book and read you some from the book tonight. Um, these are big questions that I don't think there are actually answers to per se, but they're perspectives on them. And so I'd want to begin by asking you to think about what does it mean to have a free press? Right? We talk a lot in the United States about the free press. It's something that is enshrined in the Constitution, in the First Amendment, along with the rights to free speech, to assembly, and to petition the government. Uh, the importance of a free press has been affirmed in numerous Supreme Court decisions. Um, uh, but we don't often talk about what it actually means to have a free press. Uh, and working with Project Censored has challenged me almost on a daily basis to think about that. And also to ask another really big question that I don't think there's a simple a definitive answer to. Um, do we have a free press in the United States? I think at the surface level, the answer to that question may appear simple, but it's actually, I think, a deep, complex question that raises all kinds of interesting points for discussion if we care to dive into it. So with that in mind, um, what I wanted to do is um, start by uh, suggesting to you um, one take on what happens if we don't have a free press. And this is from um, the journalist Walter Lippmann. Uh, he wrote this in 1920, so almost 100 years ago now. Um, uh, Walter Lippmann is remembered not only as a legendary journalist, but in many ways as one of the founders of what we know today as media studies. In 1920, he wrote, if we lack a steady supply of trustworthy and relevant news, we can expect incompetence and aimlessness, corruption and disloyalty, panic and ultimate disaster. No one, Lewis uh, Lippmann wrote, can manage anything on PAP, neither can a people. Right? So ideally, the news uh, helps us, helps identify, verify, it investigates, it analyzes, it explains. And news professionalists, journalists, editors, and the like, all engage and employ news judgment in the ideal terms in service of the public good, right? But we live in an era now uh, that is considerably different um, uh, from previous areas, I think. Um, the idea of fake news is not simply a description these days, but it's actually kind of a rhetorical weapon. Uh, we live in an era where uh, uh, internet giants like Facebook and Google propose to curate our news for us in order to protect us from, Im from, from stories that might be misleading or um, problematic in some way. And as a result, the, the nonprofit organization that I work for, uh, Project Censored, is having a bit of what they say, uh, what we call like having a bit of a moment right now, right? We are hearing a lot uh, when we have public events um, that, oh, what you're doing is, is more important than ever, right? And that's flattering, um, but it's also a little sobering, like, after 43 years, you might wish that the kind of work that the project was established to do would no longer be necessary. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the project's uh, uh, mission in general terms and then dive into some of the, the contents of this year's book, Censored 2019. Um, as a nonprofit, our two primary missions are to um, provide critical media literacy education and I'll say a bit in a moment about how we do that. Uh, and, the other, and the other core uh, uh, component of our mission is to uh, encourage the public to be aware of and to s provide meaningful support for independent investigative journalism. So the first, um, critical media literacy education, 
Uh, as Nancy mentioned in her gracious introduction, um, uh, I, for the last six years, I've coordinated the project's validated independent news program. And this program, which was established in 2010 as a component of the project, links um, literally hundreds of college and university students and professors at several dozen um, uh, colleges and universities across the country in a collective effort to track, uh, to identify, and to invent important news stories that are not uh, being covered in the corporate press. This is in some ways an expansion and uh, uh, a, a, a development of what Project Censored was originally founded to do. Um, uh, at Sonoma State, uh, Carl Jensen in 1976 started Project Censored specifically with students in his sociology and journalism classes at Sonoma State to investigate these underreported, important but underreported stories. So the validated independent news program uh, that I help coordinate basically takes that program that started at Sonoma State and has expanded it to be uh, national and even continental in scale. We, we have um, several campuses in Canada that also have students and faculty participating in contributing stories. So when I say vetting the stories, um, what we're doing, this is the validated part of validated independent news. We're looking at the stories. The stories are being reviewed for their quality, for their trustworthiness, their factual accuracy, um, their importance, their significance. And then we're also uh, uh, looking um, to see to what extent does this story provide perspective that is not available in the corporate media? Either these stories have been excluded entirely from coverage in the corporate media, or they've been covered in what, what I think of as a partial way, where partial could mean either incomplete or in a, in a biased, slanted way. So each year, students participating in the validated independent news program, I may slip into Project Censor jargon here, and you'll hear me call it the VINS program. That's what I'm talking about. Um, each year, uh, students uh, working with faculty mentors review several hundred stories. Um, this year, the top 25 list that is the first chapter of this book um, represents the collective efforts of 351 students um, 15 faculty members from 13 different uh, college and university campuses. So, so there are a few people's names on the cover of this book, but as soon as you start opening up the pages, this book is the product of multiple voices and multiple perspectives. Um, so these stories, once a student has identified a story, determined that the story is uh, of high quality, made an initial assessment that the story has not been well covered in the corporate press, it becomes a validated independent news story. And we post those stories on our website as VINs, or validated independent news stories. And one of the things that I'm most excited about um, keep, that keeps me hopeful and engaged with the project is the role that stu the fundamental role that students play. Let me read you a little bit about that. Um, from the introduction to this, the ch chapter one of this year's book. In our experience, students are hungry to contribute to something meaningful that goes beyond the confines of their classrooms. As they come to develop expertise and passion for their story topics, publishing their findings online and in the project's yearbook gives them a public voice that they might not otherwise have. They become informed and compelling advocates for issues that the general public may not adequately understand. Thus, students' direct development of their critical thinking and media literacy skills contributes to a collective effort to better inform the public about the importance of a truly free press and the existence of high-quality alternatives to the corporate versions of the news that otherwise set a narrow agenda for what and who counts as important and newsworthy in the United States. So from the start, the project has been founded on this idea that students College students with no, not necessarily any prior experience in journalism or background are capable of doing this work with the right mentoring, with helpful, you know, uh, committed mentoring. And uh, so then once these stories are posted on the website, there'll be several hundred and we're, we're right now, Nancy was mentioning the, the arrival of the Mueller report. For me, um, next week, 
the vast majority of candidate stories for the next censored yearbook will be arriving at project censored offices from campuses all over the country and then I'll be working like a busy spring bee um, with a team of people to begin processing those for what happens next which is uh, in the spring we vote and there are two rounds of voting to determine the stories that eventually make it to the top 25. The first round of voting involves all the students and faculty from the campuses that have contributed stories that year. And they vote to reduce the ballot from about 300 or so stories down to approximately 30. And, that, and then that, that reduced, you know, 30 superstar, all-star stories goes to the project's international panel of judges. Um, these are esteemed people. Um, with expertise in, in news, journalism, and media, everything from uh, independent editors and journalists, news editors and journalists, to uh, professors of, of uh, media and communications. One of our judges is a former FCC commissioner. Um, and the judges then undertake a second round of voting to determine the top 25 and to rank those stories. So by the time a story makes it into uh, the book as one of the year's top 25, it's undergone no fewer than five distinct rounds of review and vetting uh, to assure that the story is factually uh, reliable, um, you know, socially and politically significant, and has not appeared uh, in a meaningful way in, in the corporate press. So um, with that as background, um, let me tell you a little bit about what's in this year's top 25 list. Our number one story this year is um, about a global decline in the rule of law. This is a story that was originally published in The Guardian based on a report by the World Justice Project, which every two years undertakes a mammoth investigation of the state of the rule of law around the country. They examine 113 countries. They interview, I'm not sure I'll get these figures exactly right. You can look at the story in the book and tell me if I botched them. They interview people from 110 households and 3,000 um, um, professors, lawyers, authors, countries all around the world. And they determined uh, this year that across the board, something like uh, 70 per, 71 of the 113 countries in the world that they've studied have witnessed fundament, uh, declines in fundamental rights in the last two years. And by fundamental rights, they're talking about things like the right to privacy, um, the right to uh, due process if you're accused of a crime, um, the right of labor to organize, and so forth, um, the right to speech. Um, so that's our number one story this year. Uh, it's amazing to me, I, I don't mean to sound too much like this, but it's amazing to me that, uh, uh, that uh, a report of that significance and uh, with that kind of um, remarkable depth and validity, it, that was literally, to our knowledge, not covered anywhere in the corporate press except for one outlet, the name of which I'm not going to recall off the top of my head that basically reproduced the Guardian story. So had the Guardian not covered it, it would have been nowhere at all in the corporate press. Um, a couple more. Our, our number five story, people sometimes ask, censorship in the United States? No, that's something that happens elsewhere. Our number five story is an old-fashioned censorship story. Um, the, the Washington Post um, has banned its employees from using their social media accounts to criticize sponsors of the post. So uh, the, this policy, uh, this story was broken by the Washingtonian, which is an independent Washington DC based um, uh, uh, outlet. Um, it was later reported by The Hill, which also is a DC focused and, and also important coverage from Mint Press News out of the Twin Cities. Um, the ban, uh, so, the, so the, the Washingtonian got the, the text of the guidance to employees on this. It not only told them they couldn't criticize, but it encouraged employees to snitch on one another if they thought that someone else was using their social media account that way. Um, two more stories quickly. Um, uh, 
the number nine story is one that's kind of personally, I shouldn't do that, um, that's personally uh, 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 significant to me because it was vetted by one of my former students, Eric Robledo, who was a student of mine when I taught at Citrus Community College in Southern California, and Eric's now at UC Davis, having transferred successfully. Um, and uh, the story he uh, vetted for us uh, this year is about how indigenous communities around the world are helping to win legal rights from nature. And the other reason I like this story a lot is that um, some of the crucial reporting for this story was originally reported by Yes Magazine. How many people are you familiar with Yes Magazine? That's Yes with an exclamation mark. Um, based right here in, out of Bainbridge Island, but nationally and I would argue globally important as a leader in a movement uh, known informally as solutions journalism. The idea that, uh, that a lot of our news today is negative in character. Um, and that makes it very uh, unappealing to many people. It's depressing, right? It's discouraging. Solutions journalism, as Yes Magazine so often exemplifies, is reminding us that there are good news stories that aren't simply good news like the firefighters came and rescued the cat who was trapped up the tree. Right? Good news stories about communities organizing to address real problems that they face. Uh, one more from this year's top 25, um, uh, and this story is uh, getting a little attention this week. Uh, I'll explain why in a minute. Um, the FBI has been racially profiling so-called black identity extremists. Um, this story was originally broken by uh, the journal Foreign Policy in October of 2017. It has not been well covered whatsoever in the corporate press. Um, there, despite the fact that civil liberties groups like the American Civil Liberties Union have argued that uh, the term, the very term black identity extremists um, is, is, is deeply misleading and is unclear who, or actu who might possibly count as such a, an entity. Um, so the ACLU announced, I believe yesterday or the day before, that they're suing the FBI to get documents released that will, that will expose um, uh, this program. It's a, I think it's especially uh, appalling as many commentators have noticed at a time when um, many, there's a great deal of violence being done by people who are identified as white supremacists, but the FBI continuing a long, his, a long and not um, flattering history, it continues to target um, people of color um, and uh, immigrants and activist communities. So why aren't these stories covered? If we were in one of my Introduction to Sociology courses at, at this point, um, a student who's been paying attention would surely ask, Andy, how on earth are these stories not getting the wider attention? Here's a little bit more from the first chapter of the book. There's no single simple answer to the question of why the corporate media have failed to cover the stories that comprise each year's list of stories. But one important cause of censorship in journalism can be found in the news media's corporate ties. Indeed, it's important to bear in mind that although many people refer to the nation's major newspapers, TV networks, and cable news stations as the mainstream media, it's more accurate to identify those news organizations as corporate media. As Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky argued in their classic work, Manufacturing Consent, news produced by corporate outlets is filtered by the imperative to produce profits in the form of advertising revenues. News that does not serve or runs contrary to these corporate interests is either not covered at all or is only covered in a partial way. So we have underreported stories um, that uh, you, you might think, well, this is a real downer, right? The, a lot of these stories are negative, and a lot of these stories, right, we're I'm saying here, like the corporate mo news media are failing in their uh, responsibilities to inform us as the public. Um, but I like to also emphasize there's an upside to this, which is, and this goes back to one of the core missions of the project, to encourage support for independent media. Without independent journalists and independent news outlets, these stories would be unknown to us, right? And that's, I think, uh, so that's a crucial reason to support them and, and the work they do. So when Carl Jensen, the founder of the project, um, 
When Carl Jensen, the founder of the project, first began engaging his students in this task of tracking these underreported stories, the response from people like the, you know, from people at the New York Times and, and other news outlets was, that's not fair. There are only so many column inches in the paper. There's only so much time in the broadcast. We can't cover everything. So Carl, himself a former journalist and editor, began having his students look closely at what was in the corporate news media. And what he found were, what they found were many stories that were sensational in nature, but not informative for us as citizens and community members. Carl, also a former advertising guy, coined the term junk food news to refer to these stories. He originated that term. Um, and extending that food metaphor, he referred to them as Twinkies for the brain. <laughs> So here's an example from this year's book, um, from the chapter on, on junk food news in this year's book um, that was uh, written by uh, Professor Susan Rachman and students of hers at the College of Marin in Northern California. And I should add, I, I should have said a moment ago, um, the tradition at Project Censored has been we don't just point out the junk food news stories, which might be just amplifying them further. We contrast the junk food news stories with other arguably more important stories that were going on at the same time. Here's an example from Censored 2019. Makeup guru and social media icon Kylie Jenner gave birth to a daughter, Stormy Webster, on February 1st, 2018. In September of the year before, rumors had begun to spread about Jenner's pregnancy, but nothing was ever confirmed. For months, fans had been chomping at the bit for any sign that the youngest sister of the Kardashian-Jenner family was actually pregnant. And if she was, they demanded to know who was the father. The corporate press had attempted to out Jenner's pregnancy for six months. It was featured among the trending headlines on almost every social media site. Our obsession with the Kardashian baby also helped divert attention from a startling new report on black infant mortality rates. With today's technological innovations, one would only assume high infant mortality in the U.S. was a thing of the past, but the research suggests otherwise. According to recent data from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, for every thousand live births, 4.5 white infants die in the first year of life. For black babies, that number is 11.7. This begs the question, what could be causing this racially disproportionate infant mortality rate? Um, so it could be things like smoking, drinking, poverty, overall health, education. Strikingly, even black women with advanced degrees in high paying prestigious prof professions are more likely to lose infants than, their, than white women who haven't graduated from high school. Though minimally covered in the corporate press, this infant mortality disparity has been under investigation since the 90s. The collective findings conclude that the main culprit of the black infant mortality rate is quite simply put the stress of being a black woman in the United States. The lives of black women and men are filled with greater harassment, microaggressions, fear and danger than the lives of their white counterparts. This increases the likelihood of health risks during pregnancies and childbirth. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip a whole section on the, the, the nature of all those uh, increased risks. Um, Black mothers have greater uh, uh, chance of early onset labor, more likely to be unable to carry their children to full term. And then this particular section of the junk food news chapter concludes. So while little Stormy's entry into the world was anticipated with bated breath, we as a society missed identifying and addressing an entirely treatable yet ongoing health crisis. One that highlights why movements by, like Black Lives Matter and showing up for racial justice are so desperately needed. These groups call attention to the racial disparity of infant mortality, while the corporate press continue to neglect the issue in favor of celebrity baby talk. So I think looking at the time now, um, I'm going to jump ahead um, and tell you a little bit about, so this is fairly discouraging stuff, right? Um, it not the most uplifting. You might be wishing at this point that you had stayed home and watched a basketball game on TV or maybe you could duck out and find a place for a stiff drink. Um, we try to balance, as I mentioned earlier, the sort of critical dimension of what we do at Project Censored with something that is more affirmative. Uh, that it's important, I think, 
to remind people that there are uh, significant signs of hope. And one way we do that every year in the book is with a chapter that we call Media Democracy in Action. And the idea of Media Democracy in Action is that it highlights uh, groups, organizations, initiatives that embody a notion of media democracy, the idea of uh, news and information that serves the public good. Um, this year's chapter is, uh, was put together by Steve Masick, who uh, teaches journalism and media studies at North Central College outside of Chicago. And he put together an amazing lineup of, he coordinated an amazing group of people to write this year. I'll tell you about just three of, three of the entries in this chapter this year. The first is uh, Chenjere Kumanyeka, who is a professor at Rutgers, but he's better known to most people as the creator and host of the award-winning Peabody award-winning podcast, Uncivil, which is, which is all about exploding sort of myths and misconceptions about the Civil War and its legacy, its living legacy in the United States. Another example from this year's Media Democracy in Action chapter is um, Poets Reading the News. Um, they bill themselves as journalism in verse. And before you kind of snicker and think, oh, that's a cute gimmick, um, um, you know, the idea of a, a news site written all by poets. Um, it's serious stuff. The founders of Poets Reading the News, El Aviv Newton and Jay Spagnolo, um, point out that, of course, poetry is an age-old way that humans have processed challenging things like loss and conflict um, and celebrated community. So if you go to read Poets Reading the News online, you'll find poems about contemporary issues like family detentions and gun violence um, that are immediately topical to the news of the day, um, but that are framing it in a very different way than you're used to if you're tuning in to one of the news networks uh, or cable stations. One more from Media Democracy in Action. Um, Uncoke Your Campus. Um, a student-driven initiative to hold accountable people like Charles and David Koch when they try to, uh, through uh, money and other persuasive techniques, they try to um, basically co-opt college and university campuses to pursue um, the missions of, uh, uh, and, and visions that they have for the United States. Um, so there are reasons to be hopeful. There are organizations like, you know, uh, Uncoke Your Campus. There are, uh, there's programming like uh, the Uncivil podcast. There are platforms like Poets Reading the News that provide us an alternative to the, to the, to the model of news that most of us are aware of. Um, I wanted to end tonight by reading you a somewhat longer passage from the introduction to this year's book that's all about um, critical thinking. Um, last October was the 80th anniversary of uh, probably the most famous radio broadcast in the history of the United States, the 1938 CBS broadcast of Orson Welles' radio production of, the, of War of the Worlds, which of course was H.G. Wells's science fiction classic from the end of the 19th century. Wells and his radio teammates uh, thought the story, even though the story dealt with themes of colonization, um, inv foreign invasion, um, ecological disaster, they thought that, that a story of Martians invading the Earth would be um, too boring if they presented it just as a drama. So what they did is they presented it as if it was an actual invasion happening. Um, the, 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 the CBS broadcast sounded like a, 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 the performance of a band that was interrupted by these, we knew, we, people knew, Wells and folks knew these were actors, but they were pretending to be journalists, um, government officials responding to the crisis of the Martian invasion. The 80th anniversary, um, didn't get much attention last year. I was a little disappointed. But M Mickey Huff, the project's director, and I thought it was such an interesting uh, event with such contemporary relevance that we decided to make um, the imagery, uh, you know, is, is featured on the cover. Um, and, we, we, and we tried to write a little bit about the history of that broadcast in the introduction to this year's book. Um, 
We live uh, today not in a period where we face any kind of Martian invasion, but as we note in the introduction, uh, at a time when distrust in formerly respected sources of factual information is paralleled by a glut of propaganda that threatens to suffocate us, much like the black smoke employed to deadly effect by the, the invading Martians in Wells' science fiction classic. And so um, the last bit I want to read to you tonight from, from the book, I, I'd like to ask you to think about what we might learn today about the black smoke of fake news based on uh, lessons from this 1938 broadcast. The broadcast became legendary for allegedly leading to widespread panic throughout the United States. For example, a 2013 PBS documentary about the renowned production began, quote, never before had a radio broadcast provoked such outrage or such chaos. The PBS narrative reflected decades of popular understanding of the broadcast's enduring significance as an example of the mass media's mighty influence and its audience's vulnerability to broadcast-induced hysteria. But the popular interpretation of the broadcast is at odds with the facts, as two scholars, Jefferson Pooley and Michael Sokolow, have documented in a series of articles. The real story behind the War of the Worlds is a bit more complex, they wrote in 2013. Just as the size of Wells' audience has been exaggerated, so too have reports of the resulting hysteria. Examining the lesser known history of the broadcast, um, Sokolow and Pauli identified two key factors that explained the enduring and often repeated tall tales about the broadcast's impacts. First, the broadcast took place at a time when radio, a newly developing medium, had begun to compete successfully with print for audience attention and advertising revenues. Newspaper editors promoted stories of radio causing widespread panic and consequent public chaos in an effort to undermine trust in radio as a medium and to encourage government regulation of it. The newspaper industry sensationalized the panic to prove to advertisers and regulators that radio management was irresponsible and not to be trusted. This might sound familiar today if you transpose the media. Um, second, an influential study of the broadcast, Hadley Cantrell's The Invasion from Mars, a study in the psychology of panic from 1940, reported that several million American families all over the country gathered around their radios listening to reports of an invasion from Mars causing, quote, a panic of national proportions. As one of the earliest attempts to investigate the effects of mass media on audiences, Hadley Cantrell's study legitimized the myth of the Night of Terror as perhaps nothing else could. Despite Cantrell's academic ca uh, credentials, his analysis of the broadcast impact willfully ignored evidence and promoted little more than a myth about it. Professional conflicts and financial motives led Cantrell to overstate the broadcast's actual effects on the public. The book's most dramatic claims about the widespread panic were nowhere supported by the data. The data presented in the book was collected and most carefully analyzed by two of Cantrell's research assistants, Hazel Gadet and Hertha Herzog. Attention in this study, um, actually I'm going to skip that. Um, in the months following the broadcast, Herzog and a team of four other researchers, all of whom were female, interviewed 135 listeners many of whom had allegedly been frightened by the broadcast. The interviews showed that although the listeners found the broadcast exciting, few actually believed it was real, and many engaged in what Herzog referred to as checking up to determine that the Martian invasion was a fiction. Based on her analysis of these interviews, in a November 1938 memo, Herzog framed the study's central question. Why did some listeners check up on the validity of the broadcast while others did not? Cantrell resisted making Herzog's analysis of checking up central to the manuscript until a colleague and, and rival, Paul Lesersfeld, insisted on it. Beyond its hyperbole, the most significant finding of Cantrell's Invasion from Mars study, namely that audience members used their critical ability in attempting to confirm the truth of the extraordinary broadcast originated with the research and insights of Herzog and Gadet. 
In H.G. Wells' 1898 novel, humans were no match for the Martians' superior intelligence and technology. Instead, and this is quoting from H.G. Wells' original text, after all man's devices had failed, the invading Martians were stopped and humanity was saved by putrefactive bacteria against which their systems were unprepared. In 1938, despite both radio's developing influence as a new mass medium and Orson Welles' canny sense of drama, critical ability employed by wary audience members who successfully checked up on the broadcast's veracity saved the day, as it were, preventing the eruption of widespread panic. As a very human device, critical ability, the sense of when and how to engage in checking up, as Herzog called it, remains our best defense against an invasion of fake news. Thanks so much um, for uh, coming and listening. And I think now we have enough time uh, left that we can, we can have some conversation and questions and whatever you want to talk about. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I wonder if you're familiar with uh, morning programs on radio, KBCS, such as Amy Goodman's Democracy Now, mm -hmm. the Tom Hartman program, and compare that with NPR, which tends to give, in my opinion anyway, balanced perspective on both sides of controversial issues. NPR does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, balance is, of course, one of the fundamental ways that journalists attempt to fulfill the ideal of objectivity. Um, but in my field of sociology, and in particular the sociology of news, um, people, uh, scholars are more and more beginning to question to what extent balance actually allows journalists to fulfill the ideal of objectivity. One of the arguments, and there's a lot of evidence to support this, is that um, norms of balance can often uh, create false equivalencies between positions, right? It can make it seem, and so uh, the, the most dramatic episode of this, uh, uh, instance of this that I know is the New York Times a few years ago issued, it, this is very rare, they issued a first a front page correction acknowledging that their coverage of climate change had been misleading because they had adhered to a norm of balance in talking about the different perspectives on climate change. Um, that, that by giving, in effect, balanced coverage to, to, to figures and groups that question the human causes of climate change, they had misled the public. That's a dramatic instance from the most Sorry, they, well, they had created a, a, a public sense that there was more debate about the extent to which humans were responsible for climate change than there actually is. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, uh, obviously, I think when you tune in to uh, Democracy Now! with Amy Goodman, um, most everyone probably knows that they are getting uh, not simply a liberal, uh, but, but a, a progressive, even left perspective on the news. Um, to my way of thinking, this is my personal opinion, um, that's an important counterbalance because so much of the corporate news that we receive um, is, is, insofar as it reflects and, 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 and um, topicalizes corporate interests, it reflects a very different kind of understanding of what's important in the world. Yeah. I, we should maybe just wrap up. The, the last, I have one more thing I wanted to do, and then maybe we should wrap. Please. Yeah. It's about independent bookstores, really, and independent media, right? So if you go, this is not true of every bookstore uh, such an event like this might be in. Uh, but if you go downstairs, you will find on the shelves here um, a copy of George Bernard Shaw's plays that includes Mrs. Warren's Profession which came out in, I believe, 1902 and was subject to censorship. So when George Bernard Shaw was actually able to get the play produced and published, he wrote what he called an, uh, the author's apology, which has, as far as I know, one of the best descriptions of censorship anywhere in it. Um, so this is George Bernard Shaw writing in 1902 
uh, uh, the author's apology to Mrs. Warren's profession, which he had originally, I think, uh, attempted to publish in 1894. Shaw writes, all censorships exist to prevent anyone from challenging current conceptions and existing institutions. All progress is initiated by challenging current conceptions and executed by supplanting existing institutions. Consequently, the first condition of progress is the removal of censorship. Now, it would be a longer discussion for us to have tonight about the, the extent to which there's censorship in the US uh, and, and what forms it takes. Um, uh, that's a discussion I think certainly worth thinking about and having with people you know. Um, but I mention it here tonight as we close uh, because that's the kind of book you'll find in an independent bookstore that you won't find in a big corporate chain, right? And that may not count as censorship per se, but that is the kind of reduction we see in a corporate model of the, the, the spectrum of perspectives, the diversity of perspectives that independent media, whether we're talking about plays and bookstores or news and, and uh, information, that that's why we need to champion independent media in all its forms. Thanks so much for coming tonight. Um, and uh, it's been wonderful.